Thank you, Brother Tim and praise team and choir and orchestra. What a blessing that was to worship through song. Amen. Amen. I ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. The title of the message is The Church God Builds, Part 5. The Church God Builds, Part 5, Water Baptism. We have addressed already that it is the Lord Jesus' church and he is building his church. We've addressed already what a healthy church looks like. It's one that's balanced and, and emphasizing worship, discipleship, ministry, evangelism, and fellowship. We've, we've looked at the pastoral expectations that God has given to those who shepherd his church. We've looked at membership expectations and what it means to be a part of the local body of Christ, to use your gifts and talents for the glory of Jesus as you fellowship and bond with other believers. And today is ordinance day as we look at baptism this morning and, and look at the Lord's Supper this evening. Now, what is said today for, uh, regarding baptism is going to kind of spring shot from the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Now, I know that there are people watching uh, the live stream, I know people are watching from throughout the world, and many will see it later on throughout the world, many people from different backgrounds and denominations within Christianity. And so for some of you, you're going to be hearing what Southern Baptists believe about baptism, most importantly, what we believe from Scripture, because what Scripture says is what is important, not a denominational belief, but what God's Word says. And so you're going to hear that today. And for some of you, you're going to say, well, that makes sense. I believe it. For others, you're going to need to digest it and chew on it. In this room today, you that have been Southern Baptist for many years, you're going to say, well, that makes sense. That's what I believe. Some of you are going to say, well, I've never heard it in that much detail, but I'm grateful. Others are going to say, hmm, I need to digest that a little bit. Wherever you're at, I just trust the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you and meet you where you are. Because let's be honest, the ordinances of the church, the Lord's Supper and baptism is why we have so many denominations today. Is because denominations do not agree about what I'm preaching on this morning. Uh, we have some denominations that will bab baptize infants. We have some that believe salvation saves you. We have some that believe you're baptized and then later you may or may not receive the Holy Spirit. So you're baptized before you receive the Holy Spirit. There is great division over baptism. And that's why it's vital that as a preacher of God's word, I preach on the subject of water baptism. I also want to make clear that when I say certain things regarding baptism, I'm not saying them regarding salvation. I believe there are people that have already passed on to glory, that were born again Christians and now in the presence of the Lord in heaven, that were never biblically baptized. You say, well, then what's the point? Well, there's a lot of things in Scripture that God delights in that are not directly connected to your eternal destiny. How about bringing honor and glory to Jesus? How about obedience? How about being faithful to him and his word? Those things matter to the Lord and baptism falls under that. If you found Matthew 28, please join me in standing for the reading of God's word. I'm going to be reading verses 18 through 20, but first just take a quick glance at verse 16 and you'll see that he's speaking to his 11 disciples. Judas has already betrayed him. He's speaking of the other 11 that had traveled with him. And when it says, now it says in verse 18, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the order that you gave right here in this text that you re-emphasized in other texts. Lord God, that one is to be a disciple, a follower, then one is to be baptized and discipled and taught and trained and equipped in the faith. Lord God, we thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord God, give us understanding today as to the truth regarding water baptism. Because we want, most of all, we don't want to please man. We don't want to simply believe some because it's historical. We want to believe it because it's of you, it's of your word. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
God bless you, you may be seated. So today I intend to answer multiple questions regarding baptism. So number one, how is one to be baptized? First, I want to emphasize is that in Scripture, baptisms were public. So the how speaks of whether it's public or private. Ordinances are to be done publicly. Baptisms were public, all right? The church would gather and observe a baptism. Now, there are a few examples in Scripture where someone went out by the church, sent by the church, and they would, they would lead someone to Jesus, and they would baptize them without the church being present. But those were exceptions to the rule. For example, in Acts chapter 8, uh, Philip goes to the desert road, and there he leads the Ethiopian eunuch to Jesus. And the Ethiopian eunuch after that sees water and he says, what must I do to be baptized? And, and Philip says, if you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you may. And he says, I have. And they go down in the water and Philip baptizes the eunuch. Well, that wasn't, at a, that wasn't before the church. Well, why not? Philip was sent out by the church as a missionary. He's now gone way away from the home location of the church. He's gone to that road to lead one man to Jesus, that man that's gone to Jerusalem and is heading back to Ethiopia. When that eunuch gets back to Ethiopia, there is no church church to baptize him. And so Philip baptizes him so he can go back, win people to Jesus, plant the church and baptize people. Okay. Now what I just said is extra biblical, but we know in the 300s, Ethiopia became a Christian nation by its government. Put two and two together. All right. The Ethiopian eunuch goes to Jerusalem, comes back, he's saved on the way back home, and also it wasn't private. He had an entourage. He was the treasury of the secretary of the treasury for Ethiopia. He had 20 to 60 people that did not know Jesus that witnessed his testimony of his allegiance to Jesus and Jesus alone. It was public. It was a testimony, even though it wasn't in a church setting. All right? So baptisms are public. But I also want you to see that in Scripture, baptisms were by immersion. And here in this room, among Southern Baptists, I don't think there's much pushback on that. But I want to explain why we believe what we believe. First, immersion provides the proper picture. The Lord's Supper speaks to the death of Jesus. Baptism speaks to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Let me take you to Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. They'll be on the screen for you. In this text, it speaks of your spiritual baptism. Now, we don't use that term very often, but when you are born again, if you're saved, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've received the Holy Spirit, that time where you went from death to life, that is when you were spiritually baptized. That's when you were saved. Well, your spiritual baptism is pictured in your water baptism, as I explained a moment ago in the baptistry. And so take a look with me in Romans chapter 6, verse 3. The apostle Paul writes, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? So we're connected with Jesus here. Verse 4, Therefore we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Buried like Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. That phrase comes from Romans chapter 6. And so right here we see that when we were saved, we were identified with the death of Jesus. He died physically, we died to sin and self spiritually, we're buried, and you've been made alive as a new person in Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians, the old is gone, the new has come. Praise the Lord for the new. Amen? And that's pictured and testified through immersion, going under, coming back up. Second, immersion is implied by the Greek word. The word baptism comes from the Greek word bapt, uh, and ba baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo and baptisma. Baptizo is baptized. Baptisma is baptism. Okay, and so the Greek and the English are very similar here, but you need to understand something. There is a word for sprinkle, and it is rantizo. So I want you to know that the word baptize in the New Testament sometimes it means washing dishes and it means wash. Now, when you wash dishes, you don't sprinkle, you cover it. But it's more like a shower than a bath, typically, right? 
all right? But it's still covered. It's immersed. It's submerged. It's covered. It's washed. And so a, a more broad term of the word baptizo can mean wash, but it never means sprinkle. Now, I just upset a great multitude of Christianity because I just eliminated b- biblically by the meaning of the word baptizo instead of rantizo being used, it cannot mean sprinkle. It can't mean that for a child, a baby, or an adult. Okay? And so please understand what I'm saying here. I, it, truth is truth. We've got to stick with the word. And so immersion is implied by the Greek word. Now, something really cool, I think, is Martin Luther all the way back in the 1500s at a time when Catholicism was dominant and, and baptism was of little ones. He said this, I would have those who are to be baptized completely immersed in the water as the word says and as the mystery indicates. He didn't always practice that, but that's what he said. Okay. John Calvin also, many believe that he was the starter of the Presbyterian church. That's debatable depending on which Presbyterian you talk to. But nonetheless, he is a a famous church father, and he wrote this in Institutes of Christian Religion. The word baptize means to immerse, and it is clear that the rite of immersion was observed in the ancient church. And so you have people that don't even practice immersion saying that's what the Bible says about it, that the church in the Bible did that, okay? The fact that baptism occurs after becoming disciple, Matthew 28, make disciples of them, then baptize them. Therefore, one is only being baptized if one is first a devoted follower of Jesus Christ that has been made alive spiritually. And therefore, any baptism prior to repenting and believing in Jesus is not biblical baptism. But also the word speaks of immersion in the word baptizo and baptismal. Third, immersion is confirmed in the context or by the context. I mentioned ago Philip and the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Let me take you there quickly. Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. This is after Philip had believed and they're, they're walking together. And it says, and Philip asked, can I be baptized? And I mean, or the eunuch asked, can I be baptized? And Philip said, yes. And, and then it says, and they went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. So when you speak of context, you need to ask yourself, why did they go down into the water if sprinkling gets the job done? I mean, just get a little bit. Pour it on the eunuch and say, man, nice meeting you. Blessings to you back in Ethiopia. But they both went down into the water to give the picture of death, burial, resurrection. They went down into the water because the word baptize means immerse, cover. And that's why Philip got soaked. And that's why the eunuch got soaked is because the picture and the meaning matters. Immersion is confirmed by the context Now, John's baptism, that's complicated, but John's baptism was not Christian baptism. But even in John the Baptist's baptism, he did not sprinkle, he immersed. And John, according to the context, John chapter 3, verse 23 says John also was baptizing, not rantizo, but baptizo, in Enon near Salem because there was much water there and people were coming and were being baptized. If you're only going to sprinkle, why does it matter if there's much water there? You don't need a lot of water. But to immerse, to biblically baptize, baptize the way it was in God's design, you need much water. So John went to a place where it was deep enough to get people under and back up to picture their death to sin and resurrection to new life and identify themselves with Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. Now some will say, Oh, preacher, you're going overboard. It's the thought that counts. It's, it, it, you don't have to immerse. It, it, it's, it doesn't have to be after belief. You're going overboard. You're being too nitpicky. It's the thought that counts. Well, what it, my question is, what is the thought? So let's just say that we practice sprinkling here. How does that picture the death, burial, resurrection? How does that picture, how does that connect someone with the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus? 
See, many denominations sprinkle because they believe it's like circumcision of the Old Testament. It's the sign that you enter the covenant through. We don't believe that. We believe it is an act of obedience that follows receiving the Holy Spirit, receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. Okay? It's not the thought that counts. Imagine me coming up to you and saying, i got to tell you, I have been blessed. This next week, I am scheduled to receive $100,000, and I want you to know I'm giving every cent of it to you. Every single one of you would sit up quick and pay attention. Would you say that again? I say, I, yes, next Sunday I'm giving you $100,000. I'm going to receive it this week and give it to you next Sunday. Well, then I come up to you next Sunday and I say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I did not get that $100,000. But, hey, it was the thought that counted, right? Amen. <laughs> It's not the thought that counts. It's the obedience that counts. It's the act that counts. I'm telling you, if it was the thought that counted, I would be in perfect shape because I can sit in a recliner really well and think about exercising. <laughs> but it's not the thought. It's the act. It's the obedience. You've got you to do something with what you know. Amen? In the Old Testament, when, when people start talking about it doesn't matter about baptism. It, it doesn't matter about the details of it. You need to be reminded that all throughout Scripture, God is very detailed. Very detailed. You go back and read in the law of the description of the tabernacle, and he gave the width, the height, the length. He gave the specific materials, the specific wood. He gave the specific furniture and the specific size and the specific location of each piece of furniture in the tabernacle. He gave the specific clothing the priests were to wear. And how dare anyone in Israel substitute any little detail of that? They didn't have a right to, y'all. It was specific. And biblical baptism is to be done God's way, and I don't have the right to twist it or change it, and you don't have the right to condone a baptism that's not done biblically. He is detailed about this. It's important to him. So how is one to be baptized publicly? By immersion, giving the proper picture, by immersion, which is implied by the word, and by immersion that's confirmed by the context. Now, number two, who should be baptized. Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Who are those who were made disciples? Those who heard the gospel and repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the ones that are called disciples here. And those disciples are to be baptized, and they're to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right there, we have the Trinity. We have the triune God presented in Scripture. The Trinity is part of the baptism. Now, look with me in Acts chapter 10. It will be on the screen for you. Let me share some additional text here. Acts chapter 10, verses 46 and 47. Then Peter, he just led some Gentiles to the Lord, and he says, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? Now, why is Peter asking that question? Because the gospel had just gone to the Jews and then in, in just prior to Acts chapter 10, it went to Samaria, just north of Judah. And now it's going past the Samaritans to the Gentiles. And I don't know about you, I'm a Gentile, so I'm excited to hear the gospel made it to the Gentiles. And the gospel made it to the Gentiles, and the Jew named Peter says, who can refuse water for baptism to these who have what? Received the Holy Spirit just as we have. They were saved the same way as us, but notice they received the Holy Spirit before they were water baptized. Now this is important because there are some denominations of Christianity that believe that you place your faith in Jesus and you're saved, you get baptized, and then later you may or may not receive the Holy Spirit. Typically, they use the word, you may or may not be baptized in the Spirit. Notice in Acts 10 what he said. 
Who can refuse water to these who have already received the Holy Spirit? One is to receive the Holy Spirit prior to water baptism, not after. How can I or anyone else baptize someone in the name of the Father, the Son, and then baptize them in the name of the Holy Spirit whom they do not know and have? But notice, those people are all immersed. So baptism by immersion is not the only issue. There are people that are baptized by immersion, which follows with number one that I shared, but they have not been baptized after receiving the Holy Spirit, which Acts 10 teaches, and by baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, that also teaches that they need to be born again of the Spirit. Are y'all with me? If y'all are, say amen. Okay. Let's journey now to Acts chapter 19, because we see the same teaching there. Acts 19, verse, verse 1. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, we need to show a little bit of grace here in that the church is forming, and as the gospel spread, people are hearing of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and they're placing their faith in Jesus, and sometimes people don't explain the person of the Holy Spirit to them. So Paul gets there in Ephesus, and he says, okay, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And then verse 3, and they said to him, no, no. We've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? Let me stop. Wait a second. You say you're a disciple, you're a follower of Jesus, yet you haven't heard of the Holy Spirit. Then tell me if, about your baptism because I got questions about whether that's on the up and up. Y'all with me? So he says, tell me about your baptism. And they said, into John's baptism, speaking of the baptism of John the Baptist, which was a baptism by immersion. Verse 4, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So is there a biblical precedent, an example, where people were baptized by immersion and they got rebaptized? Yes, Acts chapter 19. They had believed in Jesus, but they had not received biblical Christian baptism. John's baptism was prior to the death, burial, resurrection. Christian baptism pictures the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and your death to sin and resurrection to new life in Christ after receiving the Holy Spirit. And they receive the Holy Spirit with an understanding of it in Acts chapter 19 here. So immersion itself is not the only issue. There are others. Third, what baptism does and does not do. All right, so every denomination basically has a summary statement that lets all the others in their denomination know what they believe, okay? And we as Southern Baptists have what we call the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 which Dr. Adrian Rogers, former pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church, was the chairman of this committee. And here's what it says under baptism. It'll be on the screen for you. Christian baptism is the immersion of a believer in the water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is an act of obedience. Baptism is a picture of the believer's faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior. Baptism is a picture of the believer's death to sin, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection to walk in the new life in Christ Jesus. Baptism shows the believer's faith in the final resurrection of the dead. Baptism is required before church membership. Baptism is also required before taking the Lord's Supper. Baptism is a church ordinance. It is entrance into the local church where an individual uses their gifts and talents to edify the body of Christ. So let's ask here, 
What does baptism do? It's summarized in that statement I read, multiple things. It provides a testimony of your death to self and being alive to Christ. It provides the testimony that your allegiance is with Jesus. You're identified with his death, burial, and resurrection. It is a testimony. It is an act of obedience. Water baptism is much like a wedding band. I can take it off, and I'm still married. But I, if you see me in the grocery store, I am not communicating to you that I'm married. And now I am. Baptism doesn't save you, but let's not minimize it. It is vitally important because when one is baptized, as Davis was this morning, they are testifying, I belong to King Jesus. My allegiance is to him. I am identified in his death, burial, and resurrection. I am obeying my Lord. It is a testimony. It is the gospel being proclaimed in the death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. And the wedding band is a symbol. Baptism is the symbol. It is the sign. What does baptism not do? It doesn't save you. And you need to realize if you've been baptized here, at First Baptist Millington, you could go to another denomination and they would not accept your baptism because they believe baptism actually is part of saving you. And they would require you to be baptized there. I got no problem with them sticking with their beliefs. I just believe they're wrong. Baptism doesn't save, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved from your sin that is leading you to hell. You'll be rescued from your sin leading you to hell if you confess and believe. Notice there's no water baptism mentioned there. But yet, you're saved. The apostle Paul did not see baptism and the gospel as one thing. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, he writes, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, if it was required for an individual to be water baptized for them to go to heaven, then Paul would have said, God has sent me to preach the gospel and baptize. But he said, I, he did not send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel. Paul separated the two. And we should separate the two. Baptism only has significance if you first receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's an act of obedience that follows conversion. Adrian Rogers wrote this, Many people misunderstand baptism. Some act as though since baptism does not save us, it isn't important. Other people make the mistake of saying, If you don't get baptized, you'll never go to heaven. Baptism isn't necessary for salvation, but it is necessary for obedience. Obedience is necessary for you if you are going to experience joy and growth and fruitfulness in the Christian life. May we not minimize what the Bible emphasizes. Every believer is to be baptized. Number four, when is one to be baptized? This is our final question of the day. When is one to be baptized? Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, baptize the new converts, the, the new disciples. Those are the ones to be baptized. Not baptize those who are not disciples, but baptize those who are disciples. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So then those who had received his word were baptized. Exactly what it says in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 as far as the order is exactly the order we find in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. They received the word. They heard it. They believed it. They laid claim to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then they were baptized after that. Continue on at reading in that text. It says, those who had received the word were baptized and that day they were added about 3,000 souls, and they were continuing to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now, I know y'all are tired, a lot of information. Stay with me. Just do this right here now. Stay with me. I really want you to be able to explain this to someone, okay? In, Acts chapter, in Matthew 28, it says, make disciples, baptize, teach. In Acts 2... Peter taught, 
and they received the word. They were made disciples, then they were baptized, and then they were taught the third part of the Great Commission. They devoted themselves, at verse 42, the apostles' teaching. They were being taught. They devoted themselves to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. The breaking of bread is the Lord's Supper. So notice the order. They received Jesus. They were baptized, identifying with the body of believers. And then they were discipled in the faith. They were matured. They were taught. They were trained. They were equipped. And they took the Lord's Supper together as God's people. That's the order. That's the order. The Lord's Supper is not for lost people. It's his supper. It's for those who know of his blood shed for them and appreciate it. The order matters. So have you received the word? Have you been saved? Because water baptism means nothing if you haven't been born again. Have you repented of your sin, realizing you've sinned against holy God? Have you turned from your sin and trusted in Jesus? Have you become a disciple, a follower of his I encourage you, place your faith in Jesus right now. As I continue to talk, just begin to pray and ask God to save your soul. For you who know that you're saved, have you been biblically baptized? Have you been baptized understanding that the baptism doesn't save you, but it is a public testimony of who you belong to? It is an act of obedience for your Lord who saved your soul. Have you been biblically baptized, understanding that it comes after you received, you have received the Holy Spirit of God? Have you been baptized by a church that, that led you to testify through your baptism of the death to sin and the resurrection to new life? Is that what your immersion pictured according to the church that baptized you? That matters. Have you been saved? Have you been baptized? I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes, please. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would draw every lost person to yourself that's under the sound of my voice right now. Convict them of their sin and how great you are as the Savior that has come to pay the price for their sin. That you took their place on the cross and paid the debt they couldn't pay. So lead them now to trust in you who have resurrected from the dead. Save their souls. And Lord, I pray for those who are saved. That might, they might know that they have never been biblically baptized. Would you lead them to obey by faith? Maybe one that thought they were baptized already biblically just as Davis went through. Maybe you're stirring their hearts to to research this more and speak with a pastor. God, I pray that you would lead them to do so, for we are here to help, not hurt them. And I pray that they would know that their shepherds are ready to be shepherds to them this morning. Lord, would you just work in this place? I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.